I allow myself to add one comment yet. If the harlot is the identification of the Roman Empire, then she is identical with the sixth head. For I do not believe that anyone will contradict by saying the sixth head refers to the Roman Empire. But exactly in this head, the beast receives a deadly wound. The beast itself rears up again after a while. But this does not mean that the sixth head appears for a second time. But the beast lifts up its seventh head. In other words, the world empire, as portrayed by the Roman Empire, is smitten. If we identify the harlot with this empire, it follows that the harlot, at this time, receives the death blow. But this contradicts with the rest of the chapter. At the moment when the beast lays at death's door, the woman is in her prime. She deceives the thousands and she exhibits all her glory. Furthermore, she does not receive her finishing blow until the days of the eighth king, the Antichrist. She is not ruined with the sixth king, and for this reason cannot be identical to the Roman Empire. I link to this a few comments I made under 2D. This harlot is mentioned in verse 18 as the great city, Greek Paulus. I maintain that this pleads against the cultural opinion and at once has great meaning for that which is discussed later. I cannot give an elaborate discussion here on the meaning of the word Paulus, but I vividly remember that I, in one of the first winters during the war, was engaged for some time in a treatise on this subject, which fascinated me tremendously. I have in mind the book by Carl Ludwig Schmidt, The Palace in Kirche und Welt. The Palace in Church and Welt. Zurich, 1940. Schmidt first gives, as is typical of him, a great deal of linguistic material. According to Schmidt, Paulus first means city, but it also means the association of citizens, the city municipality, the city state, and the state. I hope the reader is able to understand this citation. Consequently, this is a term which indicates the association of people with citizen rights and obligations between government and subjects, between laws and offices. It should be noted, however, that Smith does understand the harlot to be a Rome, verse 13, and, as such, anything but the support for the exegesis I defend, although all of this is very important. In any case, with Paulus is meant a specific community, an organized relevant society. Therefore, it seems impossible for me to understand world as a cultural power when we speak of the harlot. The world in the sense of the world power can indeed be called Paulus. But the world from a specific aspect, the world as cultural power, can never be named Paulus. Aspects must remain abstract in nature, but not concrete communities. As far as I am concerned, the use of the term Paulus pleads very strongly against the cultural exegesis. If this is true, and I truly believe that it is, then there are only two possibilities left. The political, which sees the harlot as a world power in all her existence or one certain embodiment of it, Rome, and the ecclesiastical, which understands this to be the false church. Because of what I have previously demonstrated, we have to distinguish between the harlot and the beast and see them as being separate entities. My conception of what is meant remains uncertain as long as there are several possibilities. The picture becomes clear when the possibilities are reduced to the dilemma either world empire or false church. The beast is the world empire, is it not? And is distinct from the harlot. Consequently, there remains no other possibility than the ecclesiastical. Section 6. Further Considerations of Scripture References Naturally, it must yet be determined if the conclusion we first arrived at is supported or refuted by the above-mentioned classified data. 
First we will pursue the ones I arranged under 2. A. The woman sitting on the beast with seven heads is explained as sitting on seven mountains. Previously I pointed out that whoever identifies harlot with the beast actually makes the world power sit on itself. With this the representation becomes obscure and it becomes difficult to give a reasonable explanation. Yet the angel gives an explanation. The seven heads, first and foremost, portray seven mountains. Hereby is the geographical position of the harlot indicated. As far as I can ascertain, it is nowhere imputed, also not by myself, that these seven mountains point toward Rome, the city on seven hills. A little further on, 2b, it is stated, however, that the sitting of the woman between waters indicates her position between peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. Hereby it is not denied that this harlot resides in Rome, but definitely that she does not abide there only, for she has a place in the midst of all peoples, international, does she not? In other words, the harlot has her place in the world center of this time. Yet she also has expanded internationally. Do we now ask the question, is there anything decided in so far as the choice between ecclesiastical and political opinions are concerned? I believe the answer must be negative. For when we interpret harlot here as an indication of the world power, then we will come to a reasonable conclusion. This world power is established in Rome as center and it has its shoots internationally. Yet we see no reason either why this would contradict the ecclesiastical opinion. The church has already expanded internationally and has obtained a place in Rome as well. The false church? Indeed, for the Jews resided in Rome and were scattered among all peoples at the time when John wrote Revelation. I do not believe that what we understand in the Belgic Confession both pertinently and terminologically, as false church, was unknown to John. I think here of 2 verse 9, where he writes of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. John is familiar with a society who claims to be the congregation of the living God, but in reality is a synagogue of Satan. Anyone who understands that a synagogue is one of the terms which indicates an ecclesiastical gathering can also comprehend that John knows of those congregations which bear this name illegitimately. Compare this with the beginning of Article 29 of the Belgic Confession. In other words, what was mentioned under A neither proves nor disproves anything of the ecclesiastical view. B. The sitting on the seven heads is at the same time explained as sitting on seven kings, of which five have already fallen. The sixth is present at the time, while the seventh does not appear until later. The historical place of the harlot is indicated by this. She is said to be sitting on the beast with seven heads. This is, according to the explanation, she is sitting on the world empire which in the past already showed five forms of existence, and at this time exhibits the sixth form, and will evolve further in the future. We shall determine if this is of future benefit for us. The sixth head is the Roman Empire. According to some, the harlot is the world power also. But what does the sitting on then mean? The world power would then be sitting on itself. This is meaningless. Perhaps we could yet consider if this might be a feature of the vision which could be ignored. But this is at odds with the explanation of the angel as he brings this section into account. He indicates this sitting on to be geographical as well as a historical position. If we now understand the harlot as the empire, then the whole indication of the historical position is thereby nullified. If we nevertheless think of the false church, then the meaning is preserved. The sitting on then means that this false church leans on the world power 
and is sustained by it. She relies on the empire as it, in the course of the ages, has received its center in Rome and from there puts her iron hand on all peoples of the then known earth. Compare Gradanus, Court of Verklaring, page 252. Court of Verklaring means short commentary. Gradanus wrote the volume on the Revelation to John. This section pleads in favor of the ecclesiastical opinion and against the political. C. It says in verse 16 that the ten horns torture the harlot in a horrible manner. I pointed out earlier that also Gradanus, although he forcefully persists in the correlation between the harlot and the beast, could not find his direction clearly in this verse, and thus speaks of this verse as pointing to the papal church. I also stated that I completely agree with Gradanus. Here we must think of two distinct entities when dealing with harlot and beast. I do not want to limit this to the papal church, but I also understand this to be the false church in various forms, as does the Belgian Confession. In accordance with this I refer to Ezekiel 16 and 23. This parallel has been seen by many, and is very remarkable. Reverend Ploy does not deny this either, although he tries to make the appeal to Ezekiel ineffective by asking some questions which he would rather not express. For didn't he write, Now we will not ask if the Jerusalem of Ezekiel 16 and 23 already was false church, and neither will we ask if the false church could still expect prophecy of salvation, like the Jerusalem of Ezekiel 16 although these questions are of importance. I would like to go into these questions on account of their importance. Was Jerusalem then already false church? Yes, and why would she not be considered such? I do not wish to answer this question in a negative manner. My reasons are as follows. In the first place, what does the confession understand by false church? Our confession According to the text under Article 29, Friends Edition 1619, see Buckhuizen van der Brink, page 188, thinks of the Church which commits adultery by breaking the covenant. We should also compare the various editions which Buckhuizen van der Brink compares with each other. It is remarkable that Revelation 2 verse 9 and 17 verse 3 are considered as connected here. I have already commented on the first text. In other words, our confession speaks here also of the adulterous church, when it speaks of the false church. Compare textual references. Exactly the same case as in Ezekiel 16. If Reverend Ploy asks, could Jerusalem then be called a false church, then I answer, what does our confession mean with this term other than the sin of Ezekiel 16? In the second place, Reverend Ploy should also know that in the reform symbolism of the time, false and adulterous are interchangeable comprehensions and that harlot, meretrix, occurs as synonym of false church, ecclesia falsa. The Scottish Confession, 1560, discusses the marks by which the true church is distinguished from the false church, article 18, and says in the context, the characteristics and marks by which the pure bride of Christ can be distinguished from the unclean and abominable harlot, namely the church or assembly of the ungodly. Also the Hungarian Confession, 1562, has a superscription on chapter 5, article 7, of the marks by which the true church is distinguished from the adulterous one. Compare Muller's edition on pages 257 and 428. The term false church is not understood if we do not see adulterous church and harlot as synonymous during this time period. Why can Jerusalem, which was punished in Ezekiel 16 for its adultery, then not be called false church? in light of Calvinistic confessions? Furthermore, did Israel not destroy itself with the services of the high places? 
and was not the adultery, the unfaithfulness to the Lord, the part which was false in this church assembly? And does it not get this far eventually, so that on account of these sins someone like Hosea had to say to the people, You are not my people? Do the prophets not speak of a bill of divorce? Just because Ezekiel, in his judgment on the adultery of Jerusalem, ends with the promise of salvation, Reverend Ploy wants to conclude that John, in chapter 17 verse 16, did not have his eye on Ezekiel, because John does not know any more of mercy for the harlot. I am unable to understand this. If the Lord during an earlier period of apostasy within his church, was inclined to grant grace to his church again. Does this mean that he will also be merciful to it in the final phase of its history? Revelation 17 does deal with the end of the ages. The exile was the beginning and shadow of the definite downfall of the apostate church, but not yet as beginning and shadow of the end itself. A parallel could be drawn here with sin. Christ says that only the sin against the Holy Spirit is unpardonable. This sin was not yet known in the Old Testament because the Spirit was not yet in his full essence, as Jesus Christ had not yet been glorified. Yet the Old Testament knows of a shadow of this unforgivable sin. See Hebrews 10 verse 28 and 29. If anyone has violated the law of Moses, he will die without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the man who has trampled down the Son of God? The writer sees a similarity between the greatest sin of the Old Testament and the unpardonable sin of the New Testament. There will come an end to God's mercy. Although he sees a similarity, he also sees a difference. The aforementioned sin remained pardonable in the Old Testament, but no longer in the days of the New Testament. We should especially consider the third part of this comparison. In the Old Testament dispensation, there remained hope, even through extreme punishment, while the New Testament dispensation does not allow for this any longer for the grace has grown more abundant in the meantime. This is why the church in the Old Testament dispensation could not come to her total elimination. In the most terrible judgment that came upon the Old Testament church because of her adultery, the possibility of mercy still existed. A promise of salvation could yet follow the prophecy of judgment. But this does not mean that mercy has to again follow the judgment upon the harlotry of the church in the final days of the New Testament, nor is it necessary that John should end with a message of grace, as Ezekiel did when he spoke of the same sins and judgments. Reverend Ploy then continues with, But we will ask ourselves, is besides the church city also the world city called harlot? In the prophecies of the Old Testament? He answers this question positively when referring to Isaiah 23 verse 17, Jeremiah 51 verse 7 and Nahum 3 verse 4, which speak of the adultery of Tyre, Babylon and Nineveh, respectively. This is true, but who is denying it? I would not consider it for a moment. However, Nothing has been proven as far as Revelation 17 is concerned. The Old Testament, on occasion, speaks of the adultery of a world center. But how often was this done in comparison to the many times in which the Lord reprimands his church people for adultery? I would not like to number the occurrences which indicate the adultery of the church. When the Reverend Ploy, in his discussion, refers to some passages, three in total, where the adultery of the world is last against, then I am able to point out against this a continuous testimony from the Old Testament which turn itself against the adultery of the church. If they were counted, then it could be very well possible that there would be 300 passages. In the question of the Old Testament basis of Revelation 17, I would have many more passages at my disposal than does Reverend Ploy.